Hey everyone, we are back. Uh, we have Matt here, founder and CEO of Block Native. He'll be doing a talk on mempool primitives, how this new class of money Legos enables new experiences and strategies. Uh, once Matt starts talking, can you guys just confirm that you can hear him? Hey, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Cutler. I am founder and CEO of Block Native. I'm at mcutler on Twitter, and uh, we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about mempool primitives. Everyone can hear me okay? We're waiting. There we go. Awesome. I got the first yes, so we'll just jump right in. Um, what we're going to do today is spend 20, 25 minutes going through content. I'm actually going to do some hands-on work as well, and then uh, leave time for questions. So if you have questions, please do put them into the chat, and I'll um, bounce through those at the end assuming we have time. So uh, just real quick, we're gonna go through an agenda which includes um, crypto primitives, fundamentals, and then talk about a couple of primitives and then mastering the mempool. So jumping right in, what are crypto primitives? They, it's something that actually got a fair amount of attention and dialogue in my experience a couple of years ago. It's kind of not really part of the four anymore, but I think they're really important and critical. These are basically, the primitives are these, uh, the base level building blocks. They're not developed or derived from anything else. The most simple, most essential atomic level units of what we do. Um, and often in the world of DeFi, they're referred to as the Lego bricks, like the fundamental building bricks. So we today have the benefit of dealing on top of a whole bunch of these really um, almost assumed low level primitives around asymmetric encryption and public key signing and hash functions and things like that. And these days, most of what's happening is they're higher level primitives, you know, protocols, block explorers, gateways, things that you don't really need to think about very much. You just say, oh, you have that problem? Go use a block explorer. That'll solve it for you. We're building a protocol for lending. We're building a protocol for derivatives. We're building a protocol for um, synthetic assets, right? And so these are the fundamental units that we in our ecosystem use to sort of think about or conceive of what it is that we're doing. And, and, Really what these things do is they enable, sorry, I'm just flipping something here, um, crypto composability, right? They're the foundation of composability and therefore they're, the, they're what enable expressiveness. That fundamentally as a developer in this space, your ability to build interesting, uh, valuable, useful things is a function of the crypto primitives that you have to manipulate, right? So uh, in the, the vein of these are like Lego bricks, you know, here's a Lego house, right? Using Lego bricks. It's a relatively primitive, relatively simple um, thing that you're building, but you can recognize it as a house. It's got a door, it's got a window, it's got a roof, it's a house. Um, but we know that, that that's kind of a basic thing and that if you give builders more primitives, more fundamental things to work with, then builders can build ever more sophisticated um, constructions. And so here is also a Lego house, right? This happens to be a Lego Sydney Opera House, a much more sophisticated structure, much more expressive than the one we showed earlier, but only made possible because there's a uh, th this Lego house is using many more bricks of many more variety, right? So you provide builders with additional primitives, with additional fundamental bu fundamental building blocks, they can build net new things. Okay, so uh, with that as a foundation, let's talk just a little bit about fundamentals now. Earlier in the, in, the, in the day in Liquidity 2020, I gave a Mempool 101 um, session. Uh, if you're not really Mempool familiar, I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to that. Um, but just to, to, to baseline here, um, what is the Mempool? The Mempool is the sort of staging area before a transaction can go on chain. So when you submit a transaction, you wait for a while, sometimes a long while, and then it gets confirmed like what actually happens. It turns out, you submit it to the mempool. It sits at pending in the mempool alongside uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of other transactions, and it competes in the mempool for block space. Now, this is an area which generally is not very well understood or, or really even thought about that much in our ecosystem. Um, but we at Block Native have really been focused on it because we think it represents pre-chain data. So 
Everything that happens, everything that will ever go on chain must first be preaching. And it represents value in motion. This is literally where the money is moving around in our ecosystem. Um, there's relatively little out there in terms of good diagrammatic resources of what this looks like. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. This is uh, from Taylor Monahan. She's the CEO of my crypto. And um, don't look too closely at this because there's some bad words in it, but she posted this. You can see the link to her tweet. Um, she tried to sort of write down what's actually going on in the mempool. And this is just a her quick representation of it, which is relatively accurate, in fact, quite accurate, but expresses the level of complexity, messiness, and chaos, which is endemic in mempools, okay? So just to get a little bit into this, uh, there's no such thing as the mempool. We always use the in these quotes here. Because it's pre-consensus, there's no such thing as, as a, a, a canonical mempool. There is actually just thousands of individual uh, copies of the mempool. Um, Whenever, like this diagram here on the left, there's 8,650 nodes on the network. That means there's 8,650 unique mempools. Um, uh, the mempool data is public, meaning anyone can look at it and inspect it, but every single node has a slightly different to very different copy of it. So depending on where you're looking on the network, you might see different transactions, um, but it's very hard to work with, right? The data is moving very quickly. The data is very sparse. Every single data point in a mempool can be overwritten. It's mutable. It can be changed. Um, and it's basically asymmetric, meaning there's some parties in our ecosystem that use and have access to this data. But for most builders, it's exceptionally difficult to impossible to go hands-on with mempool data to get a sense of what's going on and to use it to their advantage. And this creates all sorts of behavioral problems out there in the in the um on the blockchain, in particular, things like front running, back running, um, Ethereum is a dark forest, apex predators that are leeching profits. That's how they do it. It's all using this data, right? Now, it's not so much that mempool data is completely dark. It's just super hard to work with. So here is, uh, I just took this snapshot just a few minutes ago um, from Etherscan. They have this really cool chart um, of pending transactions. It doesn't go back very far, unfortunately. They only show about a day or two worth of, of data. But you can see the steady state here is 150,000 pending transactions at any given time. You have this really steep drop off. I'm not quite sure what that represents, if that's actually something that happened on the chain or that's actually um, something that's reflecting in their infrastructure. And then it starts to build back up. But just think every time you or your protocol or your smart contracts or your DEX submits a transaction, it is competing for block space with about 150 to 200,000 other transactions. On the Ethereum blockchain, there's a new block about every 15 seconds, but each block contains maybe 150 transactions on average. So you're trying to be, you're trying to get to one of 150 spots among 150,000 transactions. It's highly competitive. So to make sense of this, uh, Etherscan also has a, a, a site, uh, an area of their of their service where you can look at their pending transactions. So I want to call your attention to sort of the upper left corner here where it says a total of 149,979 pending transactions found. They're only going to show you the top 10,000, the most recent 10,000 transactions. So you only get access from Etherscan to about, you know, less than, I don't know, 8% of all of the transactions. And they, they page it like this. So you just sort of go through and it's just line after line after line, page one of 200, right? And you're like, well, what am I going to do with this? This is not very easy to work with. I can't really get any intelligence out of this. And then there are other sort of more interesting or, or perhaps just different visualizations. This one's one that I like um, from Zengo. And, and this shows their view, which by the way, is quite different than what Etherscan shows because everyone has a different view of what's going on on the, on the mempool. And they have this color coding, which is by gas price, but you can see these sort of massive surges and changes and these cliffs that happen. And you sort of go as a developer, like, how do I work with this data? Like I can't get access to the, the, the whole set of it because it's spread around the network. It's moving in real time. Um, when I look at mempool data, I'm not really sure what I'm looking at. It changes really quickly. There's not much here. And so this is why we at Block Nando who specialize in this, um, we think it's so important to, to talk about and begin to introduce mempool primitives. Like what are the Lego bricks 
that regular developers and traders can work with so that they can incorporate mempool data into their projects that they're building and into the trading strategies that you're employing, right? So the whole, one of the big gaps that we see in the industry is we have lacked basic primitives to even begin thinking about working with this data as it relates to pre-chain in-flight mempool data. Okay, so uh, we've been, we've introduced, we formally announced one of these uh, primitives that we're going to talk about and show it here. We'll talk about uh, another one that we're looking really seriously at and probably be introducing some new capabilities soon. But the first one is is just mempool data streams. Okay, so so the mempool you have data constantly coming in and out, literally um, on a sub second basis, and so. How do you deal with this? How do you work with mempool data? It's not a database you look up. It's not really about historical facing. It's like the leading edge of the mempool, the, the front surface of it. Tell me about things coming in as, as transactions come in and as they change state. So these mempool data streams we define in, in three ways. It's a real-time data stream. So it's, it's real-time, not historic. It's based on one or more unique addresses. This is the fundamental unit of lookup. You, you put an address or multiple addresses in, and then you get results back out. And the result, by the way, can actually be really hard to work with. It can be a fire hose where you just get hammered with data. And so optionally, you, may, you need the ability to add filters so you don't get everything coming back out, right? So this is a primitive, right? It's a Lego building block that you say it's a real-time data stream. You put addresses in, you filter it, and you get something back out that you can work with, right? And that by itself sounds pretty obvious. It takes on a whole new life in, 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 in practice, right? And so what we're gonna do now is go hands-on to work with this mempool primitive, uh, our team at Block Native has been working really hard for a long time to introduce the first ever mempool explorer. And, and it really helps um, to see it and to sort of look at the data because it starts to bring this to life. So I'm gonna pop out of the presentation and um, flip over to here. And so this is a very exploded uh, mempool explorer. So I've just zoomed way in. If you go to mempool explorer, it'll be a little bit more proportional. Um, you can do this yourself. It's live, it's fully production and, and you can get started for free. Just go to explorer.blocknative.com. But the basic idea is you have an area on the left where you can create mempool subscriptions and then you get real time feedback on the right. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. And we're gonna start with a really simple example on the Rinkeby testnet. Um, we're just gonna watch a hot wallet. So I have right here uh, my MetaMask, it's on Rinkeby. And we're just gonna create a subscription so we can watch transactions. So we're gonna call this um, Matt's wallet and I'm gonna add the address and hit create. And just like that, we're using this mempool primitive, right? We have authored a subscription. We're now monitoring the Rinkeby testnet for any transactions involving my wallet, right? Now, of course, nothing's happening. No one's sending me anything. But what I can do is I can uh, create a transaction and we can see these mempool events fire. So I'm gonna send myself just a little bit of test ETH and we're gonna do it like this. And uh, when I hit confirm here, uh, I'm using stock MetaMask, by the way, which is set up to broadcast via Infura. It's gonna hit Infura, Infura is gonna assign it to a node, the node's gonna inspect the transaction, the transaction is, if valid, is gonna get inserted into that uh, Rinkeby nodes uh, mempool. It's then gonna broadcast it to its peers, it's gonna propagate through the Rinkeby testnet, uh, our infrastructure, which is trying to get as complete a picture as possible of the mempool, will detect a new transaction, will try to match it to any pending subscriptions. If it finds one, which it should here, it will emit an event describing the transaction, okay? And all of that happens about this fast, three, two, one, confirm. And you'll see right there, this is a mempool event. You see a pending transaction um, to my wallet address with a certain value, with the nonce, right? And then as soon as the ring can be test net, confirms my transaction, there it is, we see a second event. So we detected the event with this mempool primitive. It's a new pending event. And then we detected it being confirmed, okay? And you have these very rich payloads here that tell you a lot of information about the transactions. So this is a very simple example of working with a streaming mempool primitive. Okay, now I wanna make this a little bit more interesting and a little bit more relevant. So I'm gonna reset this to scratch. And now what we're gonna do is rather than monitoring a wallet, let's monitor a smart contract. 
And this is going to be this little smart contract called Tether, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And it's one of the most uh, high volume smart contracts on all of Ethereum. So when I hit create, we're now on mainnet, we're gonna be actually watching for Tether transactions in the mempool in real time. So create, we're now monitoring. And what you see on the right here is the fire hose, right? Events pumping in where they're just every single transaction, every single state change associated with this mempool primitive, just showing up in my browser and and like, wow, okay, this is probably a little much. Um, I don't need to see all of these. I, I don't want to see um, you know, every single bit of it. And so what we can do is then filter this to make it a more relevant and more useful um, uh, mempool primitive. And so again, in this example, we were seeing everything, but let's go ahead and, and filter this down to exception transactions. So we don't want to see normal transactions. We don't want to see pending or confirmed. We just want to see the weird ones, right? So we can go in here and we can say, let's look at transaction status. And we have Boolean filters in here. So let's make it not pending. We're going to add that filter and then we're going to add another filter in here also on status. And we're going to make that not confirmed, right? And then just press play over here. Oops. Um, sorry. Let me X out of that. And now what we're doing is we're monitoring mainnet for tethered transactions, which are not pending nor confirmed. So here's a stuck transaction, right? Here's another stuck transaction. Um, by the way, these are all Etherscan links as well. So I can take the hash and click on this and now we can inspect this, right? Here's a, here's a tether transaction which has been stuck for more than seven days, right? Um, which is, uh, and it, it's just interesting. You can see all sorts of interesting things. Uh, Coming, you'll see drop transactions, failed transactions. Here's a dropped one, which means it got evicted from uh, a mempool. Um, if we look at this, let's see what's characteristic about here. Oh, it was dropped and later replaced, right? So these are examples of tools, right? That allow uh, developers to work with mempool data and to make it so that you can, you can do just about anything that you can think of. Like for instance, um, let's watch the four uh, uni farming pools on Uniswap. So here we're now watching the ETH UDC, e USDC, ETH DAI, ETH USDT, and ETH WPC pool for transactions. So anytime any transactions happen on those Uniswap pools, um, we'll see transactions here, right? Um, and so the net idea is, hey, this mempool data, which is very hard to capture, very hard to work with, very hard to integrate to your projects, using primitives and then tooling, which builds on that primitives, makes it much easier to work with. This is the whole idea that we're excited about and we're excited to see what people get building with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna flip back to my presentation here um, and talk about what we think is, um, where is my, hold on a second, just got to go here. Hmm. Um, oh, there we go, just a little confused. So we just went hands on. So you can do interesting things like Know when transactions above a certain volume move. Again, all this data is public. So you can see big shifts if you're yield farming and you can see big amounts of, of liquidity move in or out or specific far farming opportunities. You can detect that in real time. Um, you can know if the protocol you're building or your smart contract is part of, uh, of a pending transaction. You can integrate this stuff with Slack and Discord and get messages and alerts when certain things happen. Um, you can know when specific oracles are changing and even set thresholds on what those oracles are changing to and so on and so forth, right? And so this fundamental idea of a mempool primitive focused on real-time streaming data Data we think is really powerful for the ecosystem. Um, another primitive, and by the way, we'll talk about two primitives today, but we actually believe there are many potential mempool primitives, um, is one that we talk about in terms of mempool dynamics, right? So whereas the streaming data is about the leading edge of the mempool, sort of transaction state changes on the way in, a mempool dynamics is about characterizing the state of the mempool as a whole. So if on-chain data is discrete, meaning 
the, the Ethereum blockchain clicks forward about every 15 seconds. And that's the only time it changes is when a block is confirmed. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain changes about every 10 minutes, right? It, it ratchets forward just like a clock, or just like a watch, click, 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 right? Um, Pre-chain or mempool data is dynamic. It's constantly changing, literally on a sub-second basis. It's always in flux. So it requires very different tooling, very different approach to think about how you work with it, right? And so what we're proposing for mempool dynamics is, hey, what you really want to do is characterize the mempool as like what's going on right now. And so the two big building blocks we're thinking hard about is this notion of a gas price snapshot. So like of all the transactions that are currently pending, what's their distribution by gas price? So you can see the status of it. And then critically, how fast is it changing? Remember before we showed those visualizations from folks like Etherscan and from Zengo, and you see these big surges and cliffs of transactions coming in and going out of the, of the mempool. And so gas prices don't just have a, a point in time, but they have like momentum acceleration. You know, they have all sorts of other uh, physical analogies of how rapidly they're moving. And this is critical because if you're trying to get a predictable transaction performance, you need to know not just how to price your transaction right now, but you need to know, are the conditions changing around me? So a properly priced transaction in just a few seconds could be underpriced or maybe even overpriced, right? And so um, we think there's a whole bunch of interesting things that are possible around um, having real-time feeds that describe uh, gas price snapshot and rate of change. Now, the good news here is there's already some folks that seem to be working on this as well, so we think are, are, are quite relevant. Um, the first and probably best known is ETH Gas Station, which basically reports back on gas prices by by segment. It, pretty interesting, actually. They used to have fast, medium, and slow, and they recently changed their labels to trader fast and standard. Um, so uh, it just a, it's a funny sort of thing that that reveals a lot about how they look at the world. But ETH gas station, part of how they calculate their gas prices is historical. So they look across prior, I think, 100 blocks. Um, whereas uh, the guys at um, uh, Sparkpool recently produced this tool called Gas Now, which basically updates with every block. It's, it's pretty interesting to watch. So this is just a snapshot of it. But they will show with every block sort of what the various segments of gas prices are, which we think is, is useful and relevant. Um, and so these are also uh, integral parts of this notion of a um, mempool dynamics primitive. As you can see, like the mempool um, data streams is dealing with one slice of the mempool. The mempool dynamics is looking at the mempool a different way. And we actually believe there are many valid ways, many useful ways that builders and traders need to work with mempool data, each of which requires a, a primitive that needs to be carefully constructed and then tooling to implement that primitive so you have to do it yourself. Um, this is all in efforts to master the mempool. Um, uh, uh, more and more focus is being attention on uh, being paid attention to this notion of Ethereum as a dark forest, where you have all sorts of actors who primarily operate in the mempool, who are leaching transactions, leaping leaching profits from members of the ecosystem. And so, if we take this notion of Ethereum as a dark forest, what what we and others out there are trying to do is is bring some light. And, and start to illuminate the dark forest such that um, we can level the playing field. Because right now there are pretty significant information asymmetries between different actors in the network. And that basically runs counter to the whole ethos of what we're trying to accomplish. So our goal and objective is to illuminate um, the, the, the dark forest, make it a bright forest. And uh, we're lucky to be working with many of the top projects in the space. We have hundreds of, of folks who use our libraries in production. Here's just a handful of them. And uh, we're right at just over uh, three minutes, uh, sorry, just at the 23rd minute here. So we have time for questions. But what we went through were crypto primitives, mempool fundamentals. We talked about two primitives in, in specific mempool data streams. You went hand on and we talked a little bit about mempool dynamics and then the importance of mastering the mempool. Um, again, my name is Matt. I am the founder and CEO of Block Native and my Twitter handle is at mcutler. And I am going to stop the share now. 
so I can potentially answer a few questions. Um, so any questions you have, by all means, put into the chat. Um, I see right there that um, the analogies and visual comparisons are useful. What we find with mempool data is it's very abstract. It's it's just not easy to wrap your mind around. So uh, we regularly speak in, in metaphors and try to come up with examples and, and things that, that, that have it make sense. In my prior talk, the one I gave earlier today on mempool 101, we talked about um, you know, people show up expecting um, like a waltz or, you know, a, a square dance or a flash mob, something organized and fun to be a part of. And what they wind up with in the mempool is a mosh pit that your transaction is just jostling with and competing against all sorts of other transactions who are not just idly sitting there dancing their own dance, they're, they're actively running into you and trying to adversely affect you. And so uh, don't think about the mempool as a benign place or as a orderly place, it's a, it's a chaotic place. And so having visibility and awareness and monitoring of it is really um, very appropriate. Um, we at Block Data, this is what we do all day, every day, we're total mempool nerds. Um, and so we publish on it on our blog, we produce tools, you can get free access to it. We have backend APIs, we have front end stuff like Mempool Explorer. We have more stuff coming down the line that we're really excited to bring to market as well. So if, if you're a builder or a trader who is uh, looking to incorporate Mempool data into your operations, whether it be from a monitoring perspective, so you can make sure transactions are going okay, whether it's from a security perspective to make sure nobody's doing weird things with your protocol, or whether it's from a, a, a you know take advantage of it so you can be more profitable and more efficient, um, we have a lot of capabilities that we can bring to bear. Um, and so uh, do definitely, if this is interesting, check out my Mempool 101 stuff, read our blog. But with that, um, I think I'm going to hand things back to our moderators and thank everybody for their time today. And uh, if you have any questions, by all means, find me on Twitter, okay? Cool. I actually think there are two questions in the Ask a Question section. Oh. oh if you haven't answered those already. No, I have not. So I'm, I'm looking at the chat. Um, can the Explorer filter pending transactions where a certain address is the target of an internal message generated from executing that transaction? The simple answer is yes. Um, internal transactions are, are pretty fascinating. So um, in the world, just to, to, to make sure everybody's on the same, same page, the world of Ethereum has what are called transactions and internal transactions confusing. I like to think of transactions as external transactions, and they're initiated from an, uh, an EOA, an externally owned account, like a wallet, generally controlled by a person, um, and they can fire events into smart contracts. Once an external transaction has hit a smart contract, that smart contract can then fire events to other smart contracts. Those are known as internal transactions. It's contract to contract communication. And believe it or not, um, for every external transaction on Ethereum, there are between two and four internal transactions. There's way more internal transactions on Ethereum than external transactions, and they're completely invisible. There's no record of them. They don't do anything. If the smart contract the developer, developer specifically in, includes a piece of code called an event, it will emit events describing them or uh, on certain things, but generally developers don't because you pay gas on that. So it increases the cost of, of conducting the transaction. So these internal transactions are invisible and mysterious. And uh, what we do in our, uh, with our platform and with our Mempool Explorer is you can search on, you can, you can create streams that are specifically oriented on internal transactions and flag um, addresses which are party to them. Now, critically, we do that for confirmed transactions only. And the reason why is when transactions are pending, What's going to happen with internal transactions is indeterminate because oftentimes it's a function of the state of the chain, though a feature that we're actively working on and will be introducing is transaction simulation that will allow pending internal transactions. But again, those will be probabilistic because you don't really know how internal transactions are going to resolve until the block is finalized. So that's a pretty fun question. Um, and in terms of uh, links to the blog, which I appreciate, uh, just go to blocknative.com, our blog's on, on the top, or I'm pretty sure you can get to it at blog.blocknative.com. If you're curious about our APIs, definitely check out our documentation. Um, uh, uh, our documentation is, is very thorough and very up to date and will help you understand how it's working underneath the covers. And then um, join our Discord. So our Discord is a really great resource for discussion and commentary and, and support in particular. You can watch all of our 
more GitHub polls there as well. So you can watch us um, work on various various pieces. And, and we're regularly shipping new products. So if our product today, our platform doesn't do something that you want it to do, um, please ask for it because we want to know. But but more than likely, it's something that's in the in the pipeline already because we're, we're pushing really hard on it. So anyways, really appreciate those questions. And, and hopefully that, that answered both of them. Thanks, Matt. This was really great. Um, so we're going to transition to our next talk now. I really appreciate your time. You bet. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend. Yep. Bye.